The following program, The Lightning Strike, is sponsored by Muhammad Fahim and to the extent applicable their guests. The views and opinions expressed therein do not necessarily reflect those of Heartland Signal, LLC, or its management. Get ready to be jolted out of the ordinary and into a world where conversations are charged with intensity and facts. The Lightning Strike Talk Radio with your host, Mohammed Fahim, broadcasting live from the heart of the city on Chicago's Progressive Talk Radio, WCPT 820 AM. Welcome to a radio show that charges through the airwaves with an electricity like no other. Here's your host, Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, Chicago, and thank you for tuning in to The Lightning Strike. I'm your host, Mohammed Fahim. With me in the studios today, nobody but Dylan and me. And uh, Ken and uh, John Arena would be calling in. Our show again is I'm already on. going to be very power packed. Ken, good morning. Good morning. I'm on assignment in Frankfurt this morning. I'm practicing my look surprised expression <laughs> on the rare off chance that somebody throws me a surprise 65th birthday party tomorrow. Okay, so happy birthday, and I hope that you are going to be able to come out on your birthday, at least get your car started. And uh, John, good morning. Hey, good morning, uh, Mohammed and uh, Ken. Happy birthday. Okay, uh, so uh, Shayadika, <laughs> is that the excuse you're using this time? That, that's the one I came up with at short notice. <laughs> okay, uh, folks, our uh, person of the week is going to be Dr. Nicole Davis. She is a PhD uh, counselor and uh, with uh, Family Futures, and she is also the today's uh, Family Futures uh, TV show host. Uh, very powerful, very insightful. Uh, she will be joining us about 9:40, as we usually do with our Person of the Week. But uh, so much to cover every week. It the time just flies, and uh, some of our how oh, how do I put it? Some of our productive politicians they keep on giving and by that uh, you know who i mean okay <laughs> okay yeah hey, john, um, from, from, is that john is that is that like sciatica williams that one girl i used to go out with <laughs> <laughs> okay I, I, I would never tread on your territory <laughs> okay, so a uh, <laughs> couple of uh, quick things, guys, I wanted to bring up to, to, to your attention today. The Dexter Reed case, where our uh, police fired like 96 rounds at somebody uh, in, yeah. uh, in less than a couple of minutes. I mean, w- what is this, man? And uh, the, the family now has uh, filed a federal lawsuit, and the medical examiner uh, has ruled that as a homicide now. Okay, so the lawsuit against the city of Chicago and the five officers involved in pulling Reed over on March 21 outlines 17 counts, including three counts of excessive force, wrongful death, and two violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act. That hence uh, a key part of Reed's past, right? So the 81-page uh, filing now that uh, that has been done in the in the latest development in the case has sparked uh, so much controversy in the city ever since Chicago Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, released footage of the traffic stop. And first they claimed that, oh, the guy did not have his seatbelt on. Then they played it back up, said, man, maybe it, it was not that. Uh, we need people to be held accountable, okay? And uh, if you need to join in in the conversation, folks, the number to call in is 773-763-9278. And you're always welcome to call in or you're welcome to text us also on this number. The other thing that I wanted to bring up today is this pro-Palestinian protests that are continuing at colleges across the U.S. now. Uh, I believe about 45 different campuses are now uh, in uh, getting involved in this and uh, major universities several schools have called police to remove the demonstrations and as schools crack down many students are saying that they are prepared to accept the consequences to support their cause uh, my question again guys to you guys first amendment rights okay officials at the washington university and st louis have said that more than 80 people were arrested 
during their demonstration just uh, yesterday on Saturday, right? Uh, including the Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein, according to her campaign. And I think uh, we need to also talk about the the third party candidates. I mean, do they help? Do they hurt the major party candidates? Is there a future for a third party in our country? Oh, we need to discuss that also, okay? And again, folks, if you want to join in the conversation, please feel free to call 773-763-9278. Okay, coming back uh, to the uh, Palestinian protest now. Uh, in California, police have responded to another protest at USC overnight, and Cal Poly Humboldt says it will close for the rest of the semester and go to remote instruction while protests remain inside the campus buildings. Here in the local Chicago area, we have had protests at North, uh, Northern Illinois University, Northwestern University, uh, University of Chicago, I believe. And uh, at New York's Columbia University, which is the epicenter of the demonstrations, protesters are demanding the school cut ties with Israeli academic institutions and disinvest from Israel-linked entities as the death toll climbs from Israel's bombardment of Gaza and the demonstrators at the comp uh, campuses have made similar demands. So we are uh, at a very existential place in our history now in the country. Gentlemen, your take. Let us start off with Dexter Reed. Uh, okay. Um well, Dr. Reed, didn't they say that he pulled the gun first? And I could be wrong. There might be another incident. But let's go back to the campus thing. Well, um, let's, uh, I can, totally can, 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 hang on one second. Yeah. Can, hang on one second. Let's, uh, okay, let's, let's do the, the campus things. And we'll come back to uh, Dr. Reed, okay? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I definitely think that First Amendment rights should be upheld, and I think there's an overreaction calling police in there to, uh, to uh, go against the students. But then on the other hand, a lot of these students, they're protesting, and half of them don't even know what the heck they're protesting about. I mean, they, when they were questioned about it, they just like the idea of protesting. So there needs to be a much bigger uh, discussion and education mm -hmm. so they know both sides of the argument. I mean, and it's not saying that they're not legitimately have a point, which I, part of that point I agree with, but you have to be knowledgeable on what it is that you're actually trying to do. And there are two sides of every issue. It's not just one against the other. There's a nuanced thing, and you have a proportional majority of the Israeli people who probably feel the same way as the protesters do, but then now this has turned into an anti-Semitic raid, which is not right either. Okay, so well, I, John, if I could, if, your if, take. If I could offer, I mean, I think by and large the protesters know why they're there. I think, I think it's, it's what's, what's a misnomer in the general media is that if they're protesting, they're being anti-Semitic. And there are, within any group, extremes, as we mm -hmm. all know, yep. in, our, in our families, in our friend groups, and, and in our social media context. But in the reality is there's an awful lot of Jewish uh, representation protesting the treatment of Gazans. So there is representation across the spectrum. And somebody like Mike Johnson going to Columbia and saying in, some, in an offhand, almost blanket way, saying, if you are protesting anything about Israel, you're anti-Semitic, is a horrible misnomer. And I hear, and I hear echoes of the 60s civil rights uh, protests here because what were they faced with? They were faced with overhand, uh, you know, high-handed police tactics and mis mischaracterizations of what their, their goals were in order to subvert their message in the general media. And we're going to have a hard time if this is the way it continues leading into the Democratic Convention in Chicago. These people have a right to protest. And as we've talked about on this show, uh, there are some horrors going mm -hmm. on. But we can't constantly go back to October 7th and say, but October 7th, ignoring the last six months and the the. the calamity that has been this war in Gaza. Yeah, not just the last six months, uh, John, the last 75 years now. Here's uh, Mike Johnson goes and claims that Hamas supports the pro-Palestinian anti-Israel protest at Columbia University. He also went on to say that, uh, you know, con there should be congressional intervention, including pulling of federal funding from the institutions. And uh, this guy just came, came straight up and says that... Uh, 
in a post on X on Thursday morning, okay, that these guys uh, were waving, prote- you know, uh, Hamas flags. Now, ABC News has not documented any cases of protesters waving no. Hamas flags, as Johnson suggested. So this guy is just coming in and gaslighting issues. And um, I don't know well, if that is the like, right way to do this, man. Yeah. Well, it seems you like know he what? I know why. It's CYA. Thing. He has to, he's covering his butt basically because he uh, decided to let the um, you know the bill go through to where we can support Ukraine. So he has to pander to the far right extremists in some respect so he can maintain his job. Is probably where he's coming from. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not sure he knows the difference between the Palestinian flag and whatever the Hamas flag would be. <laughs> because I see an awful lot of Palestinian flags. So maybe he could do some homework. Well, I, I think that's, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. So, folks, uh, it's about 9.15. Again, if you would like to join the conversation, 773-763-9278. We'll also be looking today at what is happening in India with the Indian elections uh, going on now. Started April 19th, and it'll go up till June. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back at the other end of the break. Folks, did you know there's a program in Illinois that, if you qualify for it, would allow you to get solar installed in your home at no out-of-pocket cost? The benefit to you would be a reduction of your electric bill, possibly as high as 30 to 50 percent, and more importantly, you would take out the uncertainty of almost guaranteed future price increases imposed from your electric company. If you'd like to see if you can qualify for this program, call Ken DeLuke at 312-617-8979. That's 312-617-8979. Help us save the environment and change that electric bill burden. Welcome back to the Lightning Strike with Mohammed Fahim. Okay, folks, good morning. Welcome back uh, to the Lightning Strike. Uh, our website is tlschicago.com for the Lightning Strike Chicago. If you would like to support the show, please show some love. Go over there. There is a button to donate uh, for us to pay for the time that we have on the radio over here. And uh, you can always make a contribution. Okay. Having said that, if you would like to be a guest on the show, again, go to the website, tlschicago.com. There is a tab there that says guest. Go over there, send us a request. We will see what we can do to bring you on in the studio or over the phone to talk about issues that you are passionate about. Remember, I keep on saying that this is a show of the people, by the people, for the people, okay? And you are the people you have to get involved. The problem that I see, uh, Ken and John, in our country, we are letting the tail wag the dog. Okay, come election time, we are lucky to get between 20 to 30 percent turnout of registered voters. We are not talking of people who have not yet registered to vote. Registered voters, you have the power, folks, to make a difference. Please come out and vote. And but before you vote. Take a look at the issues. Take a look at the people that want to represent you. See what their background is. See who is funding them, okay? Because the the representatives that we have in, in Congress right now, or any of the uh, senators and all of that, many of them 
have been bought over multiple times by vested interest. That's the best word that I can use. I don't want to name names, but uh, there are some organizations, some agencies out there who are representing uh, foreign powers and buying our Congress and our Senate. Okay, Ken, John, so we are back to the Dexter Reed thing now. Mm-hmm. 96 shot and w- uh, one officer, it seemed, uh, reloaded three times. Yeah, Officer Spanos uh, fired his weapon more than 50 times during the incident and three times after uh, uh, Dexter Reed was on the ground and not moving. Um, so of the 13 times he was hit, three of those were point-blank range as Holy Spanos moly. stood over him. Holy yeah. moly. And I'm looking at uh, the medical examiner's report also, John. Uh, the guy was shot in the back also. He was shot on the backside of the buttocks also. What is happening? I mean, is this a, a reaction? Is the police not being trained properly? I know a lot of good friends of mine, and uh, I don't know, man. I, 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 well, just, I, just, I just don't know, folks. I'm, I'm shaking, Muhammad, uh, shaking my head at this point. Let me let me offer some some context here because there's been some really good reporting uh, on the People's Fabric and Jinx Press Collective uh, that have been doing FOIAs over the last you know month or so uh-huh. as this has developed. And one of the things is Spanos has some connections, family connections, going back to other troubled officers. But it appears that he was on a TAC team that has minimum requirements. And he's a 23-year-old just out of the – he only had two years as a police officer. And the requirements for being on a tactical team say you have to have at least three years or prior police or military experience, which he does not have. So there's one question about what was he even doing on this tact team in the first place. And the other thing that I learned reading on some of the uh, stuff that they've been able to FOIA is when the the video that – a, a body camera wears uh-huh. it is constantly recording but when they push the button it starts saving the data okay and what happens is it goes back 60 60 seconds um in the video without audio so you can actually see what these officers were doing before they ever encountered dexter reed and for what i'm told from people who have watched the entire video is that they were all standing around their car about a mile away from where this incident took place. And something happens, somebody's looking at their phone, they jump in the car, and they intercept Dexter Reed at the intersection where this happened. Okay. And there is no time for them to have observed him driving without a seatbelt, mm-hmm. despite his, even if his windows were perfectly clear. They literally targeted this vehicle in an area where it's almost, there's no way out of that city grid. It's kind of blocked in. So something something happened where they got a notice that a specific person or vehicle was in a specific location, and then they drove to that location. So this whole story about, well, we were just patrolling and yeah. we came upon this guy is completely debunked if, if that video evidence exists. And that's what I'm told exists. And I'm going to do some more research to to see that video. Okay, but, see, and that's uh, that's the point, John. That's the point that uh, where we where we see that we want to hold people accountable. Yep, let us do that. And we got Ron from Michigan calling in. Hey, Ron, good to hear from you again, my friend. What is on your mind regarding the shooting? Good morning, Mohammed, and good morning. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you know those officers who did the shooting. I, I, I'm just imagining here. They probably had this individual under surveillance from a number of officers. At some point, he had his window down, I imagine, and they saw a seatbelt. Maybe they even saw a gun, uh, him handling a gun, and he rolled the window up when he saw tactical officers. And the tactical officers came, came upon him. He pointed a gun. He started shooting. And in those officers' minds, they saw Ella, Ella French, her head blown off by a gang, a, a carload of gangbangers, and he, they got away with it, okay? They're going to live their lives in jail, getting high, getting, you know, ha- having luxury in prison, okay? Don't tell me that's anything that's different. They're going to have luxury in prison. They should be dead. 
And the officers, maybe they're remembering the assassination of the last officer before this one here, whose funeral is today. Mm-hmm. Maybe it went through their mind. And maybe they said, you know, this, this guy's not going to blow our head off like he blew off it. We're going to blow his head off. And I'll bet you everybody in that neighborhood, who, 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 that gangbanger was shot. That, that gangbanger is not going to come and, and carjack me. That gangbanger is not going to stick a gun down my mouth and knock my teeth out and take my purse. You know, okay, you know it's too bad that... <clears throat> that's one uh, that's one way of looking at it Ron thank you again uh, for listening to the yeah. show and and calling in uh, you are one of our regular callers but here's the hey, thing hey. here's the thing I, I let John uh, John uh, counter that and John go ahead well I, I mean this this is one of the things that I appreciate the caller's opinion but it is nothing but his opinion mm-hmm. if, and here's the here's the debate all of the rhetoric that he just offered uh, is his rhetoric, and I doubt that even 1% of it is, has any basis in fact or investigation. But the problem is that if we, th- if we have officers who are driving around that are saying, I am constantly in mortal danger in every single encounter I make, I have the right to use excessive force because I'm afraid of what might happen or I have to get retribution for what happened to another officer in a completely different situation, then we have a massive problem with policing. Mm -hmm. That means that if I get pulled over as as a a former political uh, representative of this community and there's officers that don't like the things that I might have said about officers who are making racist comments about a development in my neighborhood, then I have to be afraid that they're going to say, we don't know what John Arena is going to do. We might have to pull our guns. If you're making a, a seatbelt stop, first off, if, if you're make, a seatbelt stop is not a primary reason to pull anybody over. The only way you can issue a seatbelt ticket is if it is ancillary to another legitimate mm-hmm. at police action. So it is, he can say, well, they, maybe they saw it. I just relayed, there's a 60-minute video that says they didn't have, wouldn't have had any knowledge of whether he had a seatbelt on or not because of the windows and because they raced to that area and weren't actually following him. So the problem we have is, are our police a paramilitary occupying force that we all have to be afraid of and they are acting in, from a place of fear every single day? I would say the test for being a police officer is if you live in fear every single day, you should not have a gun, you should not have a badge. That is not the world we live in. I don't walk down the street on the north side of Chicago being worried about having my purse stolen or having my teeth knocked out. And I have lived here my entire adult life and raised two children. Okay, so uh, John, uh, on on, on that note, uh, both John, Ron, and Ken, uh, a a couple of years back, I was... uh, I was on Devon and Western Avenue. I was walking at that intersection, okay, having parked and we were out shopping or something. So I see a police car writing a ticket while sitting in his car. There were two policemen in the car, okay? Mm -hmm. They wrote a ticket. The guy sticks his hand out and slaps it on, on a car's windshield. Okay, now just, just visualize this, guys. So he slaps it on the windshield, the ticket slides off and falls on the ground, okay, on the road. So me being the good uh, good person that I am, the humanitarian in me, I bend down, I pick up the ticket to hand it to the police officer. Guys, you won't believe it, he almost took my head off. He started just shouting at me, exploring. Lives, uh, you can. Uh, you, I don't even want to repeat the words that he said. And here I'm trying to help out our police by handing him a ticket that had fallen on the ground. Okay, so yeah, you're right. Uh, I think there is uh, some training that definitely needs to change, man. I mean, we keep on hearing this. Oh, he was afraid. He was afraid. Yeah, you shouldn't be afraid if you are trained properly. Your muscle memory should kick in. And uh, there's no excuse for firing off three clips of 15 shots each in 45 seconds. Yeah, it, it requires you to reload at least at least t- 
twice because you would have maybe 15 rounds in the first clip and then mm-hmm. maybe you two more. But, you know, again, what is what is the response that is required? And, you know, I will I will hold that if an officer is fired upon, there has to be a reaction. And, and but there was also a doctrine in policing that that it has to be proportional and it has to be reasonable. And even if they shot him and he fell out of the car, to walk up to an individual and shoot him three more times suggest severe mental impact is hey. the officer that would do that. Hey, John, now that you're talking hey, about... John, unfortunately, like, here, let me let me type in here a little bit. I, I think what... The, I mean, I used to own a restaurant in the southwest side of Chicago, and I would say about 80% of my clientele were police officers. So I have an utmost respect for the police. But unfortunately, there are individuals that take that job for the power trip. And I think part of the problem lies there should be a more intense psychological evaluation of officers coming onto the force. So these people are, you know, they can determine if they have a, the right mindset to actually be an officer. Because I think a lot of these guys who do stuff like we just heard about, they, they just, you know, they're on there to, you know, because they saw something on TV and they want to play that game. Yep. See, here, here's the thing, guys. I'm, I'm not uh, trying to dump on police officers. They got a very tough job. They don't know when they come out in the morning to go to work whether they will be getting back home safe and sound. So I take my hat off to police officers for the tough job that they have. But, John, you're talking about uh, uh, proportionality, right, of response. That brings me back to what is happening in the Middle East uh, with with the war in Gaza also. Okay, granted... That Hamas came out and uh, they killed 1,200 people. And by the way, uh, of the 1,200, now it seems out uh, that it was about 745 or so were civilians. <coughs> and the rest uh, were uh, Israeli armed forces. Okay. And uh, there was mm-hmm. one baby that was killed. Uh, that's about it. So there was not like 40 babies uh, hung up uh, on, on a close line like the the reports that we were seeing. So, proportionality again, folks. 1,200 brutally killed, condemn Hamas all you want, I do too, but to go back and kill 40,000 people, is that proportionality? Not at all. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's just it's genocide. Yeah, disproportionate on a grander scale. Okay. But, and, I, but I think we're in this moment where it, it, in the, it, under the guise, under the blanket of of public safety, whether it's in Israel, Israel or here on Chicago streets, that we say that executions happen without due process, and that's okay, and that's a proportional response. And it's this is not the first case. I was in office for eight years, and I can't tell you how many settlements we had to agree to because the proportionality of mm-hmm. response was so excessive that we had no case in court. And that's hundreds of millions of dollars a year that citizens are paying to cover these lawsuits. So if, if whether it's a fiscal responsibility issue or a human rights issue, to say, well, they were afraid, so they get to pop off as many shots as they want and react like it's a military engagement, that's not policing. Hey, that's John, not let's, let's not say then it's not they; it's one person, the Yahoo. Okay. Well, in and this case, in, I'm, in this case, I'm talking about the four, the four officers involved. I I also oh, okay, have a lot okay. of respect for the police and have a lot of police police friends, fire friends. I, I respect them too, but I don't respect just like people would tell me they don't like politicians because there's a corrupt politician out there. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't mean that's me or every other politician. Right. That that just means we're talking about the one in front of us. So in this case, we're talking about the situation in front of us. OK, I was talking about the uh, Israeli thing, but OK. OK. So no, yeah, I, think I mean, there's this a corollary here. Yeah, here's the thing, guys. I mean, these things are so interrelated. OK, if how do you respond back? And uh, now uh, President Biden, by the way, uh, was just this uh, yesterday. He was talking about, oh, the $60 billion of aid 
uh, to Ukraine is creating jobs over here in America. Okay. He was talking about the this bomber being made over here and, you know, that armament being made over here that we're sending over there. So it's like, oh, it is creating economic uh, development here in America, the aid that we are giving to Ukraine. Uh, John, okay, you and now, I... Now in his defense, <clears throat> Mohammed, in his defense, that makes sense because everyone's <clears throat> complaining on why, why are we sending all of our money over to Ukraine, which in essence we're not actually doing. We're sending arms to Ukraine and the money is being spent here, so it's actually stimulating our economy as well. It's not just a giveaway to another country. So, I mean, a lot of the far right are making this a big point, like how can we just spend our money over there? He's trying to make the point that we're spending it over here. So, I mean, he does have a legitimate statement. When okay, he says here's, here's that. the... Oh, by the way, Ken, Ken here, here's, the, here's the counter to that, okay? Is that a good spend of our tax dollars to help kill people in other countries? Absolutely. Would you rather see Putin take over like you? Hey, come on, man. Listen, listen, listen. I I keep on hearing that, okay? I keep on hearing that. Yeah. But that is, you know, that is a, that is, Ken, that that is something that we are being sold on. That oh, would you want Putin to come take over? Uh, you know what? We're being sold on it because it's based on a true story. If Putin had his way, if he okay. was there to help support Ukraine, he would not stop there. He'd probably go into Poland and do everything else. He has okay. the same authoritarian mindset as our former ex-president. Okay, okay so why he are we the power and Ken? Ken, why are we supporting? Yeah. Uh, why why are we supporting Israel then with all these? Uh, you know, the 30 or 26 billion dollars that we are sending them again to kill people who are not doing anything to to, to the country as, as such, right? All right again, well, it is our well, money, okay. our right, money, our question. bombs. I'll answer that. I'll answer that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do we agree with Israel, Israel's stance right now, or I should say Netanyahu's stance in Palestine? Absolutely, we do not. And if you've seen our position on that, Basically, Biden kind of read uh, Yahoo the Riot Act and said, stop this crap, or we're going to let go nuts on you and cut your, your, your funding. So, yeah, but we do support Israel because if we didn't, then they would be in the uh, crosshairs of every <coughs> Arab nation in Iran and everyone else in that region trying to, you know, wipe them off the face of the earth because that is their mandate, okay? Okay. So, there, it's, not a, it's not a one versus other program. It's it's a nuanced situation here. Okay. Okay. So, folks, here's here's the the kind of discussions that we have on the, on the lightning strike, open discussions where we allow each other to talk about issues and listen to to each other. If you'd like to join the conversation again, the number is seven seven three seven six three nine two seven eight. We'll take a quick break and uh, come back on the other side of the break. Again, our person of the week is going to be a very very interesting character that we have, uh, and she would be excuse me, she would be calling in, and that is Dr. Nicole Davis. She is PhD. She's a counselor, and also the host of the Family Futures Today TV show. And I am so tired today, as you can hear in my voice, and I've got a scratchy throat. Okay, we have uh, a quick break for about uh, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and uh, we'll be right back with Dave from Hoffman Estates. Thank you so much uh, for holding on.
Welcome back to the Lightning Strike with Mohammed Fahim. Okay, folks, uh, so catch in the bottle. That is Bill Shepard, our director, our musical director for the Lightning Strike. Uh, thank you, Bill, for putting together that jingle for us, writing it, uh, producing it, sending it to us, and supporting the show. Again, if you would like to support the show, please go to our website, TLS for the Lightning Strike Chicago dot com. Uh, we're here every Sunday morning. Um, you know, rain or shine, uh, shadic pain or no shadic pain, or car not starting or not. Uh, starting those are the excuses that Ken and John have today and <laughs> Dave from Hoffman <laughs> States Dave uh, you are on the lightning strike good morning what's on your mind Dave good morning yeah I, I told the screener I picked up late on your conversation about the police but it, uh-huh. that's about there was an article I read oh, about four years ago on the difference between the American police and like in Finland and Norway and Netherlands and stuff like that. Like, for example, you know, they believe in life. They, as much as possible, uh-huh. they shoot for, they try to get a non vital part of the body. Like, I'll give you an example when uh, the background then in Finland they had one of these Al Qaeda thugs one and knife a couple people in the street there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And the Finnish police came up upon. They hit them in the leg or whatever. They dropped them, and they got, guess what? They had a life prisoner to try to get some information out instead of a, a body going to the morgue like we got. Well, and another thing, they are all pretty highly educated, like teachers are, and have they got a unit though that similar to a SWAT. I mean, if somebody wants to play a little harder, well, they can accommodate them with that too, and they can also go on the fly, but. Uh, but they also, they're required to attend a national academy, a college, if you will, for police uh-huh. for three years. For three years versus the U.S. police average is about 19 weeks of classroom instruction. So, and, they, and they pair up these uh, rookie guys pretty much with some senior guys to learn, learn the ropes. Yep, and the, the senior guys uh, are showing them how to use the rope to hang someone. Okay, so that's the problem. Okay. Uh, so not we. Over in America, yeah, but not over there. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying over here. Uh, some Something yeah. definitely oh. needs to change, folks. Okay, like I said, I got all the respect for police officers that you can think of. They got a tough job, okay? Especially when we have a catch and release policy in place by our court systems and our district attorneys. Okay. Uh, police have a tough time don't get me wrong but still guys okay why shoot to kill every single time i've heard the argument that oh no they, their life is at stake yeah but hey you can disable a person okay very easily you don't have to shoot them 96 times in, in what two minutes that is crazy, and that is what I have issue with, folks. Uh, again, uh, let's uh, come back uh, to a couple of the things that we were discussing, uh, especially uh, our... Uh, why are we trying to police the rest of the world, guys? Why are we policing the rest of the world? Oh, though, though they are going to take over the world, so we have to go in. The military-industrial complex is keeping wars alive somewhere in the world at any given time. And you know, 82% yeah. of Congress was more supportive of Israel recently. And uh, this is an analysis by the Guardian newspapers. And the average uh, person in Congress, they, they received about $125,000 uh, from APAC. Can you believe that? The people that they were supporting mm-hmm. Israel. Okay, the people that were supporting uh, Palestine, they managed to get about 18,000 compared to 125,000 in contributions uh, from pro-Israel donors on, on average. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would love for the country of Israel to, to exist, man. Don't get me wrong, okay? They have the right to exist. But the, the Zionist ideology that is driving Israel right now, that needs to change. Okay. People used to live in peace before Israel was formed. I mean, there were Jews, there were Christians, uh, there were Muslims, there were all kinds of people in that part of the world. They lived peacefully. There were little skirmishes, things happened. 
but to go in and kill 40,000 people, including, you know, over 15,000 children. And Muhammad, now, please, yes, sir. Please, Mohammed, so let, let me interrupt just a second here. This isn't a philosophy of the majority of the people in Israel. This is the philosophy of one man who's afraid to go to jail. Oh, absolutely. So he has to keep a perpetual war going. So it's one person. It's not a, you can't blanket. No, 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 not, not, not blanketing it. Ken, I, I totally agree with you, not blanketing it. There's the, yeah. the, the Jewish people as a whole are wonderful people. They hold to some high values. And I have, I have a lot of friends who have come in and also spoken recently at these uh, you know, ceasefire resolutions in different cities that are going on now. A lot of Jewish people have come up and spoken up in support of the ceasefire resolutions. But yeah, uh, Yahoo is trying to save his behind. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And then uh, why are we falling for it? Why, why are we as a country not saying that enough is enough? We're going to shut this pigot down till you are out. Haven't we just done that? No. I mean, seriously, seriously, he wanted to go and he wanted to bomb the heck out of, uh, what's it, Rafa? Or, oh, he's still, he's doing it, to... Ken. He's doing it. It's just not being yeah, reported. He's not doing it to the extent... He's not doing it to the extent that he was before because Biden came in and stepped on his toes and said, hey, dude, you got to stop this stuff. Otherwise, there's going to be like serious consequences. So, well, I, I hope so, man. Much worse. So I, I hope I, so. I'm just saying that what you're saying makes sense, and I think we're making efforts to that end right now. And we'll well, because uh, there is an, uh, uh, Ken, because there's an election coming up, okay? There's an election coming well, I mean, up, and no, uh, Biden is seeing... the right thing to do. Well, no, Biden is, seeing the, the, the right Biden is seeing the writing on the wall, okay? Uh, okay, let's enough, uh, enough of Biden and Gaza and all of those, go, you know, go, those things. The life will continue for them, and we will continue conversations as the show progresses. But we got uh, Sheila White, our segment producer for our Person of the Week, on the line, and we also have Dr. Nicole Davis on the line. Sheila, good morning. Good morning, and also good morning, uh, Ken, and happy birthday to you. <laughs> Ken, 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 Ken has no idea what his real birthday is. He was found abandoned in front of the church. <laughs> well, you know, I am, uh, I'm excited about our person of the week. Our person of the week is Dr. Nicole Davis, and she's a wife, a mother. She's, um, she is also a leadership development coach. She's very passionate about family and women and also leader, leadership development, like I said. Dr. Davis is a Navy veteran, a federal mediator, and a harassment prevention expert. And she's the co-founder of Empower to Engage. I'd like to welcome Dr. Nicole Davis to the show this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Should I wish Ken a happy birthday, too? Happy, well, happy, you. happy found day is what we are going to call from now on. Okay. Happy found day, Ken. Okay. Uh, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for joining. Uh, hey, we got uh, John also, John Arena, our, our regular co-host. Uh, he claims he has got shyatika this morning, but he's able to speak. So I don't know how he's able to speak with shyatika. John, how are you able to speak with shyatika, man? Well, sciatica is in your hip, so I don't talk oh. out of my back. I, talk, I, I use the top half for this part. I, 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 I'm sorry. I was thinking of, uh, you know, Trump. <laughs> Empower to engage in some of the great work that you're doing in the community. Yes, thank you. So Empower to Engage is an organization, as you said, where we do mediation, coaching, and consulting. And a lot of the mediation work that I do is twofold. It's either with families that are in high conflict, that are either going through child custody issues or divorce, or with organizations, workplace issues and conflicts where leaders or staff are having a hard time getting together, working together, understanding each other. And so we get the opportunity to be in those arenas and also train them and offer consulting when leaders just don't know how to deal with conflict. That's a thing that comes up quite a bit. You know, anywhere you have two or more people, conflict is absolutely going to happen. But how you address it 
is where we have our thumb on the pulse of what needs to take place to change the, the transfer and transform how employers and employees work together. Okay, so uh, what are some of the challenges that you see employers are facing, for example, when you go in, uh, do you sit down, take a look at uh, what has happened in the past, where they want to go? How, how do you start off the conversation with an employer, for example? Yes, yeah, so most of my work comes through contracts where with a lot of federal agencies. So they have either requirements where, you know, yearly they just have to make sure employees and employers are aware of how they need to treat each other, or they could have a specific problem that they're dealing with. Maybe it's getting people to be on the same page about how they're dealing with projects. It could be getting the right staff in place. They're just hiring all the wrong people, and the retention rate is poor. And you have employees that are disgruntled, the morale is down, and so they may need an assessment. Like, can you come in and see why we're having problems? Or can you come in and see why this team isn't working well together? And so it normally starts with a conversation and an assessment of what's going wrong. Okay, so... You uh, said that there's requirements from uh, who, what agency would require that type of intervention? What type of agencies would require that type of intervention? Yeah, you say that, you was that your question? that uh, business is required that they do this. Uh, what What's the agency that would be overseeing that? Yeah, those, yeah, any federal agency you can think of, they have training requirements every year, you know, that they have to put their employees through. And most of those deal with harassment. They deal with uh, conflict and workplace, listening, communication, like all the things that it takes for a team to work together. They have so many hours that they're required to bring someone in to provide training. Now, is that uh, an issue for certain industries, or is that pretty much wide in certain areas? How yeah, you can. Any so okay so you can say FDIC you can see say TSA you can say Veterans Affairs it's all federal agencies actually have training requirements mm -hmm. for their teams. Okay. Yep. So uh, Nicole, again, if you are talking with somebody, you have all said that part of your practice is helping people who are going through a tough phys uh, tough emotional challenge like divorce and things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you approach that? I mean, again, I'm trying to figure out how do you start the conversation? How yeah. does it develop? What kind of uh, change do you bring about in someone's personal life? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, the first thing I want to know is what made them feel like they needed either to file for a divorce or to go to court about the situation. What was happening that the two of you couldn't talk anymore? And mm -hmm. so I allow them to share and give me as much information as they want about what led them to that place. There was a breakdown in communication. Maybe there was a job opportunity in another state or city, and one of the um, parties, one of the parents didn't want to move. One of the spouses didn't want to move. It could be finances. Maybe they share financial responsibility, and one of them is not doing their part, but they're not communicating or they're not saying, why they're not able to do their part or money problems like you're spending your money on things that is not what we agreed to or how they parent it could be so many different things but i need to hear from them what made you feel like you could no longer do this together and once they tell me that i then ask them what would be the ideal situation for you in order for this to get back on track? What would you like to see happen? Mm -hmm. And so when I know what their goals are, then I can guide the conversation and how best to get them to that place. So do you think uh, the breakdown of our nuclear families like that we used to have in the past, if we had issues, we had elders in the family that could help guide us. That is no longer there now. In most families, it's... You know, the young people, they just want to strike out, go on their own, have their own little apartment and think they can, uh, you know, they can live their life without any input from elders. 
Uh, especially in our yes. culture, in the Indian culture, mm-hmm. uh, elders are so highly respected. Uh, you will not find too many uh, people from India putting their parents in an, in an old people's home, for example. We take care of our own. Right. And our parents are there to yeah. guide us with their experience. And uh, so there's more help from a nuclear family. Do you think that uh, that should be the, the, the case in, in, in other places also? Yeah, I think that's spot on, you know, and I do deal with various cultures, and there are many cultures where, you know, the parents are in the home, but if they marry outside their culture, sometimes the other spouse doesn't appreciate it, doesn't understand it, doesn't respect it. Mm -hmm. And so when you have situations that are, you know, you're trying to decide how are the two of you going to make decisions. One of the options that they have is that one of you can have primary decision-making with tie-breaking authority. Who should have the tie-breaking authority? And if the two of you can't get along, is there anyone in your family that you would trust to help you have this conversation? And, Muhammad, most Mm -hmm. of them, even with, the cultural differences say no. There's no one that they trust to help them make that convers- that decision. So I think that's uh, that's the change that we are seeing, right? My, uh, for example, mm-hmm. my my daughter now is uh, planning on getting married. She'll be married in July, and uh, they have been going through counseling sessions, uh, both mm-hmm. uh, she and her future husband. Even though there is a strong family structure. The the problem in in our culture again is uh, people who have uh, who are you know immigrants like me don't really understand the American culture that my kids are growing up in. So mm-hmm. we are actually encouraging them to seek professional counseling. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and uh, no, that uh, is, is going to be a big help. My son got married about uh, six, uh, almost eight years back now. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know they they went through counseling. They they still go for counseling like once a year, both husband and wife. And uh, theirs is a very successful marriage. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with again communicating, right? Communicating with with your spouse, with your partner, and uh, with your family also. Yes, you're absolutely right. And let me add to that because you said counseling. And Mm -hmm. what I find is a lot of men see counseling as a bad word. And so mediation, which is one of, which is what I do, mediation Mm -hmm. or coaching, conflict coaching, parenting coaching, family coaching, marital coaching, the the term is easier to take in, like you're helping us. Counseling makes it feel like something is wrong with me, and I don't know that I want to share what's wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So mediation is the same thing, although we're not going back into your history, like how did you grow up and all of that so much as what is the problem What would you like to see happen, and what are you willing to do to see the change you're desiring? Is there is there something that you can help our good friend Donald Trump with? I think they all need help. How about that? (laughs) (laughs) Just just throwing it out there. The poor guy is going through so much right now. He's got multiple trials going on. You know, he's uh, uh, behind. Behind. (laughs) Let me interject here real quick. Speaking of that, if you haven't heard. Last night, the uh, White House Correspondents' Dinner. Yep. Um, Google that and listen to it, and it is a freaking hilarious. <laughs> okay. So, so you got so to like the tuning set. <laughs> okay, guys. So White House Correspondents <laughs> Dinner and uh, Josh, uh, the, the the guy who was uh, running it, the comedian, very funny guy, and he was saying that it might be the last White House Correspondents Dinner uh, if Trump gets elected. So please keep that in mind. Yeah, Colin Jones. Right. <laughs> Colin <laughs> Jones. Uh, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. Sheila, thank you for bringing great guests. John Kent, thank you for joining. Ron from Michigan and Dave from Hoffman States who called in. Thank you, guys. Uh, keep listening. In and uh, we'll be back again next Sunday, hopefully from 9 to 10 in the morning again with a lightning strike. Our website is tlschicago.com. You folks have a wonderful week and keep tuned for the lightning strike again. If you can watch us on Facebook Live and you can go back and catch the show on our website also. Thank you. 
The preceding program, The Lightning Strike, was sponsored by Muhammad Fahim and to the extent applicable their guests. The views 